welcome everyone to another Natural Family Planning Office Hours. And this is also an, uh, another episode of NFP Conversations. We have a special guest with us today, Dr. Bill Williams, who is the president and CEO of Bria Cell Therapeutics Corporation and member of the Catholic Medical Association. Uh, Dr. Bill was also uh, editor of the journal, the Catholic Medical Association's journal, uh, Lineker Quarterly. Uh, he'll be speaking with us today about the harmful side effects of hormonal contraceptives and uh, the effort that some physicians are now um, engaged in to try to get the FDA to issue warnings about these drugs for the general population. Uh, before we start, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heart of Jesus, burning furnace of love, inflame our hearts for love of you and your people. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Dr. Williams, if you want to take over, that'd be great. Thanks so much, Teresa. Just one minor clarification. I'm the editor-in-chief emeritus. Oh, emeritus, I'm sorry. So that's um, <laughs> a lot less work than being editor-in-chief, but I'm continuing to stay busy. And so I'm going to be talking about the FDA petition that was submitted from the Contraceptive Study Group, which is a group of us, including myself, Joel Brind, Laura Haynes, uh, Michael Manhart, H Hannah Klaus, Angela Lanfranchi, uh, Gerard Midgen, Mike Gaskins, Elvis Seaman, uh, Les Ruppersberger, and Kathleen Raviel. And you can see that this is quite a uh, collection of, um, uh, you know, very intelligent and highly uh, accomplished individuals. Um, and, you know, from all over the world, even over in South Australia. So this has been a very collaborative effort to put this together. And the original petition actually went in two years ago. Uh, and I actually just this past week have reached out to the program director there at the FDA to ask for some action because uh, none has been taken yet, which is very disappointing as you'll see as we go through this. Uh, the petition itself is available in this link um, and there's a way to add comments. So I encourage everyone to spread the word about this and to get it out there. Uh, and I'm sure Teresa will make this link available to everybody uh, who asks for it. Uh, and to you know, uh, make the comments on the website uh, and then to also be familiar that there are four supporting publications all in the Linica quarterly with the data that's in the petition uh, in, in, in more depth in some cases. So drug-related side effects, if you just look at the adverse reactions reported in patients receiving combined oral contraceptives, and this is from the YAS prescribing information, you see that it is really quite remarkable how many uh, different side effects there are, nausea, vomiting, GI symptoms, breakthrough, bleeding, spotting, change in menstrual flow, amenorrhea, temporal infertility, uh, after discontinuation of treatment, edema, and uh, melasma, breast changes, change in weight or appetite, increase or decrease, change in cervical electropion and secretion, possible diminution in lactation when given postpartum, immediate postpartum, cholestatic jaundice, migraine, rash, mood changes, um, and reduced tolerance to carbohydrates, vaginitis, change in corneal curvature, intolerance to contact lenses because of that, decrease in serum folate levels, exacerbation of lupus, which is interesting that that's in there, but they missed that it can actually predispose to the development of lupus, porphyria, uh, exacerbation of porphyria, a chorea, uh, aggravation of varicose veins, uh, anaphylactic anaphylactoid reactions. And uh, that's what they, you know, um, admit to, and that's the combined oral contraceptives. But then if you look at the progesterone only uh, uh, contraceptives, which are less commonly used, and you can see why when you look at the side effect profile, you see that there's a huge increase in menorrhagia, 
uh, that there's metamenorrhagia, that there's a uh, long spotting duration of unclean uh, etiology, P uh, increase in PMS. Um, lots of bad things happen with these. And so women tend to come off of them. And then here's a proportion of women that have various different uh, reported side effects. And I'm not gonna uh, go through them all again, but this is what they admit to already in the label. And so, you know, my question is always, why would any woman submit themself, uh, themselves to all of this for something that's not a disease, that's not treating uh, any pathology, but in fact, rendering the normal function of a body system abnormal, you know, uh, so. And so one of the things that they do uh, admit to in their labeling is cardiovascular risks, including venous thromboembolism. And it clearly can see an increase in the risk of venous thromboembolism, 3.5 uh, higher risk than if people are not using it based on recent reviews. And some of them are shown here with various agents. So this is actually acknowledged as well as an increase in the risk of myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and cardiovascular mortality. This is actually acknowledged in the labeling, but they do something very clever, and that's that they disguise it. So this is the table that you see in uh, some of the labeling of some of the oral contraceptives. Some of them actually don't admit to some of this stuff, but you know they usually have to admit to this one. But what they do is you see how they put the column for every user's non-smokers next to every user's smokers. And you see how this like goes from zero to 10.5 and you think, wow, smoking is really bad for you, right? And then they look at controls non-smokers to controls smokers and how it goes up. This really makes it look like the problem is the smoking, right? But if you just rearrange the columns, all of a sudden it becomes clear that there is a very big problem just from the contraceptive. So whereas age 15 to 24, the incidence remains zero, if you're 25 to 34, it goes from 2.7 per 100,000 women years to 4.4. And keep in mind, this is mortality rates. This isn't just, you know, uh, you know somebody who had a minor stroke and got better. This is mortality, you know. Uh, 35 to 44 goes from 6.4 to 21.5. That's a, you know, like a fourfold increase almost. And 45 plus, it's you know goes like a fivefold increase. So these are not insignificant risks, and they're not accurately conveyed because of the way the labeling is done for these hormonally active contraceptives. Now, what about breast cancer? So the World Health Organization has recognized combined oral contraceptives as, as group one carcinogens for breast cancer, as well as cervical and liver cancer. And in a large cohort study that included the entire population of Denmark, 1.8 million women were followed uh, for an average of 10.9 years and it showed the relative risk for breast cancer among all current and recent users was 1.2. So this doesn't sound like a huge increase in risk, but we're talking about breast cancer, which is the most common cancer in women by far, uh, along with lung cancer. And so, you know, this risk is still um, elevated even with less than one year of use and is much more elevated with greater than 10 years of use. Um, and it's still higher after discontinuation among women who had used hormonal contraceptives for five years or more. So, this is not an insignificant number of women developing breast cancer because of the use of these hormonally active contraceptives. And you can see some of the odds uh, or uh, relative risks from some of the best cohort studies shown in the graph here below. Uh, so this is clearly uh, something that women should be aware of and concerned about. And it's not acknowledged in the labeling of most hormonal contraceptives. What about other cancers? Well, there's also an increased risk in cervical cancer that increases with duration of use. And you can see some of the um, studies again in this graph where you can see the uh, relative risk going up 
you know, 10 to 120%, depending on the duration of use and depending on the different study that you're looking at. Now, I have to be honest, there are decreased risks of endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer and perhaps colorectal cancer, although I haven't seen that confirmed recently. Um, but the, the, the incidence of breast cancer is so much higher than these other cancers that I believe that the uh, risk outweighs these you know, relative benefits um, for endometrial and ovarian cancer. So, and this is what I just said, that even though the risk is, you know, decreases risk of ovarian, colorectal, and endometrial, it's offset by the increase in risk in breast cancer. And I think that there's a, a contribution overall to increase cancer in women, uh, you know, globally. So what about some other less well-known effects of hormonal contraceptives? Well, they, they clearly increase the susceptibility to certain autoimmune diseases. And this is not acknowledged in the labeling of any of these that I can see. Uh, they're pro-inflammatory and female, the female sex is associated with the development of most autoimmune diseases with clearly increased risks for Crohn's disease. And that's shown in the graph on the upper right here where the risk is uh, relative risk is 1.44 based on one meta-analysis, which takes into account multiple studies. And ulcerative colitis, it looks like it's 1.28, it's lesser. And you can see that in this middle graph that a lot of these um, confidence intervals cross one, which means that they don't reach statistical significance. But if you put them all together, you are seeing a, clearly a trend to an increased risk in ulcerative colitis. But more convincing is systemic lupus erythematosus. Now I'm a rheumatologist and I you know, know a lot about this disease. This is not a fun disease to have. It can do a lot of bad things. Um, much, it's a, a predominantly female disease, uh, you know, 10 to one female to male ratio. And you can see that virtually all of the studies done show an increased risk of uh, de developing systemic lupus if uh, someone has used hormonally active contraceptives. So not, not a good thing. Also, multiple sclerosis. Uh, in uh, the graph shown here, the, probably the consensus overall, and the most recent and best study is this study by Helwig, where there's clearly an increased relative risk of multiple sclerosis. Again, a predominantly female autoimmune disease, but also interstitial cystitis. Now that's a very, very common, obviously less commonly fatal or severely disabling uh, autoimmune disease, but it's a really, I, I've had patients who have this. I mean, this is not a fun thing to have, uh, interstitial cystitis. It's like having a urinary tract infection all the time, uh, not good. And uh, there's uh, the studies that I've seen show a clear increased risk for that. Also some less common things like pemphigus, and then some more common things like uh, eczema and psoriasis. There's no effect on rheumatoid arthritis or hypothyroidism. There is a decreased risk of hyperthyroidism, which is a fairly significant decreased risk. The studies that show that are all over 20 years old. So I'm not really sure where that's gone more recently with the newer formulations. Uh, whether or not that's still a presently dis decreased risk. But uh, I would point out that hyperthyroidism is a disease that is relatively simple to treat, not fun to have, but relatively simple to treat, although it does end up with you being on thyroid replacement for the rest of your life because the way to, re to treat it is to basically shut down the thyroid gland. And there also may be a decreased risk for primary biliary cirrhosis, which is a very, very rare autoimmune disease of the liver. Okay, there's more though. In particular, DMPA, uh, uh, depomedroxyprogesterone acetate, uh, or depo, um, uh, depoprovera, is uh, clearly associated with an increased risk of the transmission of HIV infection to women. And you can see the results of three different meta-analyses here. 
which showed this approximately 1.3 to 1.5 increased uh, hazard ratio of contracting HIV if someone is on this long acting contraceptive. And, uh, and so this is something that really is to me is inexcusable because there's, no, uh, there's so many other good options. Why would you put women at an increased risk for contracting HIV? Uh, when it's limited to this one agent, it turns out, because of its particular chemical structure and mechanism of action when there's so many other um, agents out there women could be using. And then there's also an increased risk with progesterone-only contraceptives of arthropathies and related disorders, eczema, contact dermatitis, pruritus, and related conditions, as well as alopecia, acne, and urticaria, uh, which is hives. And that's all from one large uh, third world cohort study. Uh, so the progesterone only ones also have some association with uh, autoimmune or rheumatic diseases. Bone fractures. Now, if you look at the labeling for progesterone only contraceptives, they'll admit that they cause osteoporosis, but they don't admit that they cause the consequence of osteoporosis and the reason that people treat osteoporosis is that it leads to bone fractures in the vertebra, in the hips, and actually uh, in the other, in the long bones as well. And so you can see there's this huge increased risk that's become very clear in recent years for DMPA for, as an example of a progesterone only contraceptive in the top three uh, bars of this graph. But Oral contraceptives also have an increased risk. It's not as high, but it's clearly there for bone fractures, completely ignored in the labeling of all these contraceptives. What about things like uh, you know, effects on the brain? There, there's clearly changes in brain structure, mate selection, decrease in libido. I mean, this is the joke that I always tell, you know, what an advertisement. Here's a pill that can make you fatter and, you know, give you all these other risks factors uh, and gain weight and all that. And at the same time, decrease your libido so that you can have sex. I mean, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but depressive symptoms I want to focus on for a moment. Dr. Hannah Klaus uh, did uh, this review. And uh, she's shown that there's, based on the literature, a clear increased risk in depression, use of antidepressants, and suicide attempts. And this is all from ver one very large uh, study. Um, but it also, it, you know, along with that, uh, there's obviously reduction in marriage and increase in, in divorce um, based on, uh, on her uh, research. And I want to point out something that's in our uh, paper that is now available online uh, at the Lineker Quarterly, uh, that there is an environmental impact because of endocrine disruption in fish populations. So basically, you know, in the waste that comes out of, you know, uh, our uh, sewage treatment, these hormonally active agents are still there. And you see male fish being feminized downstream of these, where these effluents get into our rivers. So this is a, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. This, this, this stuff is getting all over the place. Uh, probably not in high enough concentrations, we believe, to have an effect on humans, but, you know, uh, clearly there's effects on the fish population. Body weight and mass. Uh, so, there's clear changes, especially with the progesterone only contraceptives of increase in body weight, which doesn't appear to level off after a few years. It keeps going up even after 10 years of use. And we're seeing here increases of 10 to 15 pounds. Uh, and it's you know, higher than the control populations, which are shown in the little black uh, bars here. Um, oh no, this is to, I'm sorry. Here's the control in one study, this, uh, the black circles, filled in circles, and the DMPA is in the uh, squares. And then the other study, which goes on for 10 years, you can see that there's an increase compared to the control that goes, you know, is about a five pound difference after 10 years. But it's not just increase in weight, 
It's also the kind of weight. So what you see in these studies, and I'll just show the one on the left here, is an increase in adipose body mass, so increase in fat, and a decrease in lean body mass, so a decrease in muscle. It's the exact opposite of what you want it to be. Whereas the controls, when they in increase in weight, that tends to be more balanced or actually to be an increase in lean body mass. So not a good um, healthy change in body mass. Now, if you look at all of these different things that I've been talking about, and then try to put it all together, you can see an increase in the yearly incidence of multiple of these different uh, diseases and disorders um, every year, but there's also an increased cumulative incidence over time. So that you can see it, literally hundreds of thousands of cases of some of these things are increased in our population because of the use of these hormonally active agents. Uh, and you know these are not insignificant things. You know, hundreds of thousands of cases of breast cancer, hundreds of thousands of cases of depression. You know, over a hundred thousand, and, and for you know, uh, tens of thousands of cases of things like you know, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and, and lupus, and for cardiovascular disease, and this includes hypertension, which is an acknowledged risk factor for hormonal hormonally active agents. Uh, you see. It, you know, increases in cardiovascular disease. That's astronomical. What about the societal costs? One of, one of the recent papers we went through and estimated that by looking at the estimated excess number of cases and then pulling for the literature, the cost per year of, uh, of, of these things in terms of treatment. And you can see that the total at the bottom here, our bottom line here, and this includes, includes, you know, factoring in decreases in cases in hypothyroidism, uterine cancer, and ovarian cancer. The, the overall number of increased cases overall is over a million of various disease, diseases and disorders. And the overall cost is over 16 billion per year. And this is, of course, just the US. So the a huge societal cost as well. Uh, this is something I mentioned earlier, and this is from a study that Richard Ferring, uh, who I know you all know, uh, has done. And it just shows that the odds ratio of having a, a divorce uh, after you're using the pill goes up 1.26. And for a condom, it's 1.64, whereas for NFP, the odds go down. And this isn't for people who like regularly use NFP as their only method. These are people who just reported that they ever used NFP at any point in their life. So you can see that there's a you know, increase for these um, you know, different methods of contraception, but a decrease when you're using NFP. And then you can also see other societal problems, and I'm going to skip this particular slide. I mean, sexually transmitted diseases clearly went up, but uh, Laura Haynes put this all together in this nice figure, where if you look at modern contraceptive use in the black diamonds, how it spikes around 1960, that is accompanied by a decrease in the number of children living with two parents, a an increase in the number of children born to unmarried women, an increase in the divorce weight rate and an increase in the percentage of pregnancies ending in abortion. So all of these things happen showing a widespread sociological change uh, as a consequence of, or likely as a consequence of the huge increase in contraceptive use. Uh, huge societal engineering that happened. Uh, we're all been, we've all been involved in a huge experiment that none of us knew we were in. Um, and the consequences on our society, I would argue, have been devastating. In contrast with the natural methods, you can clearly see better communication between spouses, lower divorce rates, and lack of the intrinsic health risks uh, associated with hormonal contraceptives. So these are the recommendations we had for the FDA was to remove 
uh, depot medroxy progesterone acetate from the market altogether based on conclusive evidence that facilitates the transmission of HIV from men to women. And to add black box warnings regarding the risk of breast cancer, cervical cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, systemic lupus, depression, and suicide. To amend the black box warming, warning for venous thromboembolism and uh, cardiovascular events, clarifying that it is not just an increased risk for smokers, but it increases the risk for everybody. And then to add additional safety information that there may be risks also for multiple sclerosis, bone fractures, bo body mass, uh, especially for the progesterone only contraceptives and the urogenital problems associated, especially with interstitial cystitis. Now, I'm not sure this is gonna work, but I'm gonna try it. The CMA has put out radio ads and I'm just gonna play one of them narrated by Dr. Kathleen Raviel. The Catholic Medical Association supports your right to know. The birth control pill has been available for over 50 years. When it was released to market in 1960, it was thought to be a miracle drug that would free women's lives and improve family life. However, now we know that women who use the pill for a minimum of four years prior to having their first baby have a 52% higher risk of developing breast cancer, while women who use the pill for more than five years are four times more likely to develop cervical cancer. Prior to the pill, there were five sexually transmitted diseases. Today, there are more than 50. The pill has major side effects for the woman, such as weight gain, depression, stroke, and heart attack. Modern methods of natural family planning are more than 95% effective and have no harmful effects on the woman. The Catholic Medical Association supports your right to know. To learn more about natural family planning, visit the Catholic Medical Association website, cathmed.org. So the reason I like to play that is because these ads are available on the CMA website and anybody can get them and play them on your local radio station. Uh, it's a good way to get the word out there about NFP. So that brings me to the end of my presentation and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bill. That, that was incredible. Um, uh, I'm sure people have lots of questions. So um, why don't I start with um, this simple question of um, physicians. Why don't physicians, uh, why don't they commonly know this information? You know, I, 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 as having been a practicing physician, I can tell you that you never have time to read all the prescribing information that's out there. Uh, and it takes significant amount of digging into the literature to come up with, um, you know, just the literature reviews that, that we did that found out all this information I just showed you that was a process that took about five years to pull all that together. So, you know, you might go to selected gastroenterologists who will know about the inflammatory bowel disease risks with hormonal contraceptives, or you might go to a cardiologist who knows about the increased risk for hypertension. Uh, but it's just not out there right now. And one of the re main reasons for that is that it's not in the prescribing information. It's not in the pa patient information leaflet that they should be passing out to every patient who is prescribed these agents. And, you know, they really need to tell women what they're, you know, putting themselves at risk for. Uh, if a woman has a family history of inflammatory bowel disease and she's told that this increases the risk of Crohn's disease by, you know, 50%, she might really think twice about you know, using these agents and start to seek people like you to, you know, find alternatives to this. But the information just is not out there. Um, so uh, when a physician, just to dig a little deeper then, if a physician sees at least a black box warning, um, yeah. Yeah. does that get them to stop and say, wait a minute, let me take a look? Yeah, absolutely. But if you look at the black box warning, which is now present on hormonal contraceptives, it really makes it look like don't smoke and take contraceptives. Oh, sure. Don't smoke and take contraceptives. That's the message you get. 
Yeah, and that is the popular myth. Um, ev everyone um, commonly yeah. talks about that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not 100% a myth because if you do smoke and take contraceptives, then your risk is much higher than if you just do one or the other. Right. But if you just take contraceptives, the risk for those things is higher too. And it's just not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. What about when um, the uh, hormonal contraceptive does fail? Um, uh, and a woman gets pregnant, does it have an adverse effect on the developing baby? As far as I didn't see any evidence of that. Okay. I didn't see any evidence of that. And I, uh, I so I'd be hard pressed to, sure. to, to say that it does, oh, except for, of course, the obvious adverse effect, which is that it becomes an unwanted pregnancy. And what do you do with something you don't want? Yeah. You throw it out. So, Clearly, we've seen the instance of a, the rate of abortion go up uh, so much because, you know, babies are not now welcomed. Now they're mistakes yeah. that need to be corrected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the, um, what is it, DMP? Uh, that's Depo Provera, right? Yeah, Depo Provera, yeah. Is anybody still using that? I thought that was, I thought it was not being used any longer. Well, I, it's, it's still on the market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very, very sadly, what you see, and there was just a presentation on this the other day from, I don't know if you're familiar with Natural Womanhood, mm -hmm. uh, Gerard Midgen's website. They had a very nice presentation, uh, and I can't pronounce her name, the lady uh, from Africa who was talking about this, that a lot of these things like, you know, that are actually banned in the U.S. are not used in the U.S. anymore. They've shipped them to Africa and they're putting in women there with basically, you know, no informed consent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like here, this will prevent you from getting pregnant. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, well, it, even it, the, it the original, works. yeah, the original research, uh, as I understand the history of it um, uh, for the birth control pill was rather unethical um, with so many women um, suffering and even dying from, um, uh, you know, the, that phase before they, they made it, uh, I guess the trials, the drug trials. Yeah, well, the early drug trials were clearly unethical. They were done in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about racist history, yeah. you know, uh, because I mean, I, what, the Puerto Rican women not matter as much? I mean, what is the story here? And then they had two deaths on the study um, and they approved it anyway. Yeah. Uh, these are young women dying. I mean, you don't, that doesn't normally happen in clinical studies, mm -hmm. you know, of healthy young women. Right, right. And there, there's a movement, uh, a small one, albeit, but a movement for um, uh, women having informed consent um, about hormonal contraception, um, precisely because it's so harmful to the woman's health. Yeah. And, you know, one of my uh, crusades has been, and it has not been a successful one, is to find a way to get this kind of information into radio ads that uh, will be self-sustaining. Because what we've done in the past, we, we put these ads together, we've made them available, people will come along and say, I'm going to run them on my local radio station and they'll, you know, have a little bit of money to do that and they'll do it for a time period, and then it stops. Right. You know, it's not, it doesn't fuel itself. Um, if there is a way to coordinate this, and I, you know, I've been in discussion with um, uh, Ann Nolte at the Gianna Centers, and also more recently with Kathleen uh, Breschelman from uh, My Catholic Doctor, to try to put these in a format that, you know, the information in a format that then ends up with you know generating more patients for their practices that would generate increased revenue that would then allow them to continue to air them and get the information out there so women can hear it and also give them an alternative you know of where to go to mm -hmm. that would be uh, wonderful but um I, the sad thing is when i talked to ann nolte about it she said that uh you know the gianna centers all lose money uh, that's the problem right now because of the way the reimbursement works. So they have to get that fixed before this is going to be self-sustaining. But if anybody has a bright idea how to get this information into the public realm where women will actually learn about it, you know, 
Uh, yeah. Please let me know. Jennifer, Jennifer Fullen, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'm going to play the devil's advocate because um, when I try to talk about this kind of um, research, um, even the young people in my family will say, well, that they're just cherry picking, you know, they, maybe they don't use that word, but they're just using the data they want to find support what they believe. And if you go online, you can find research that says just the opposite. Um, my other question, um, again, um, as a devil's advocate, or, is um, are these correlations that you've been showing or are they causal or they affect, I guess I should say, of right. um, contraceptive hormone use? Right, so the thing that I can tell you is that if you look at the papers that I listed, what we did is we looked at all of the papers, all of the data in both directions, and it's really just the other side that does the cherry picking. I, I just can't state that too strongly. They, they love to cherry pick their data. For example, there was a paper that I just reviewed um, today that came out on breast cancer risk and cervical cancer risk and uh, not cervical, uh, ovarian and uterine cancer risk, cancer risk with hormonal contraceptives. Well, the way the study was done, it was done in the UK, and they uh, looked at uh, women who had in this database that they put together, and the database involved women between 1936 and 1970, and now they're looking at them now. And they say, well, there is a slight increase in breast cancer in certain situations, but in general, it's negligible, whereas the decrease in risk in uterine and ovarian cancers is marked. Well, if you go back to the data that I showed you on breast cancer, it is especially, um, uh, the, the risk is increased, especially in women who are currently using the pill or those who have used it within the past five years. Well, you were talking about women, they, they stopped their enrollment in 1970 into this study. So the youngest women are 50, okay? There, were, there was a small subgroup of uh, women in the study that we're still on birth control pills, but it was, you know, uh, less than 1%, much less than 1% of the women. Whereas in the overall cohort, there was like four to one women who had taken the pill versus those who never had. So they completely eliminated the most at risk group from their study. You know, women who were on contraceptive who were recently on it. And so that to me is very sneaky cherry picking. Uh, in the way the study was designed. But if you look at the papers that, that we put out there, they take into account all the papers. And for example, the stuff with the HIV transmission, those were the results of meta-analyses, which in themselves took into account 10 papers you know, on both sides of the data. So tell them to look objectively at the real data and not just at what they're fed in some Twitter feed somewhere. And then in terms of the other question, I believe it's causative. And so for, you know, for cancer, it's clear the you know, uh, uh, International Agency on Cancer has come out and said, yeah, these combined hormonal contraceptives are class one carcinogens. In, in other words, because of their mechanism of action, they're predisposing to the development of cancer you know, uh, because of what they do, because they stimulate proliferation of certain cells and that kind of thing. And then for autoimmune disease, I could say the same thing, that um, clearly these agents have an impact on the immune system that's pro-inflammatory. And uh, it's also mechanistic in the case of bone fractures, okay? All these things are clearly mechanistically driven. So I would say that it's not just an association, that it is a causation. Um, Bill, before we take the other questions, let me ask you quickly, um, has the Catholic Medical Association summarized this information into pamphlets that maybe we can distribute through our marriage and family life offices and NFP programs? Not yet. Uh, there let's, is something we're working on. Let's work on that together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I would love to do that. Um, yeah, no, that there is something that we're working on at the CMA right now, which uh, we call the case for chastity. Mm -hmm. And it goes through not just the hormonal contraceptive side effects, but all of the different scenarios where people live 
uh, lifestyles that's not in accord with Catholic teaching and what the consequences are. And so we're putting together some in-depth research on multiple topics along those lines. And once we've kind of assembled it all, the idea is to distill it down into pamphlets that sure. can go out to people. But in terms of this particular topic, if you want to do something now, let's let's do it. I mean, it's fine with me. Yeah, I, I think that it, it's it's needed. And certainly with people slowing their lives down during this pandemic, it's time to look at all our health across the board. And this would be very helpful for people. Um, yeah. And and again, I, needed. And I think it's very telling that there's no post-pandemic baby bump. Everybody yeah. thought there was going to be one, mm -hmm. but it didn't happen. And, you know, I, I, you know, I think the reason for that is, is obvious. I mean, they, they shut down access to multiple medical facilities during the pandemic, but not abortion clinics. Right. They were open. They were right. open. Yeah, it's oh. ridiculous. Um, Catherine uh, Griffin, you have your hand uh, up. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. I'm in my car. Sorry. <laughs> I'm with the Archdiocese of Boston. Um, I don't know if you know Liz Katrupi. Uh, but I'm I'm in the family life office. I'm a consultant there, and I was just wondering where we're at with the USCC and the approval process for the SEMM app and the Boston Cross Check method. Do you have any updates on that? Um, sure. Um, uh, FEM has not uh, created yet a Catholic version of their um, teacher training. So we're kind of in a limbo with them, but they're a very good NFP um, provider based on um, solid science um, and they're a secular organization. So hopefully um, we'll move forward with that. Um, and uh, the other short answer is the Boston Crosscheck. They are looking to submit their um, um, uh, documentation for uh, approval uh, but again, it has not arrived yet. Ava? Hello, how are you? Um, I have a, a two questions. The first one is, could you touch on a fertility after the pill and the rate of miscarriage or the need um, to aid in fertility to conceive after using the pill. Um, and the second question is, or and even a comment, um, how is this being presented in medical schools and OBGYN uh, lectures? Um, because I could tell you when I go to my, my doctors, they, they kind of look at me weird when I say, kind of twitch their head and that I don't want uh, any contraceptives and this is what we're using and um so i understand current doctors are are it's, it's difficult to change um the theory but what about new doctors that are coming in and medical students that are in in training is the are the side effects the the harm the harmfulness that you're showing here these studies that that you analyze, are they being presented in any way in lectures in medical school? So I'll answer these questions in reverse. The answer to the second one is no. I mean, yeah. they're, they're not, they're, you know, they, um, it, you might get a little bit in your pharmacology course um, or, you, you know, you might get a little bit of, of it on your OBGYN rotation, but I hate to even talk about this. Has anybody, seen the commercials from nurks.com, N-U-R-X. All right, these commercials are all over TV, at least the shows that I watch. Now, I watch a lot of sports and I don't know why they're on sports, but it's, NERCS is an organization that lets you basically get your contraceptive by mail order. Uh, you, you, you go to an online doctor, you apply. I would actually love it if, because uh, I can't do this because of what they asked for. Eva, you would be perfect for this. Um, if you went online to nurx.com, N-U-R-X.com, and applied for a contraceptive, I would love to know, because I, they ask you to have a photo ID and all that kind of stuff, I can't do it, you know, um, but you could do it, to see what kind of uh, informed consent they ask for. Uh, I would love to know that. 
But these commercials are all over TV and they've got these women like, oh, it's so great. I can get my contraceptive without having to go to the doctor. It's just such an awesome thing. And there's no nothing about any kind of you know, warning because they're not actually selling the contraceptive itself. They're selling access to it. So uh, you know, that completely drives me nuts. And what was the first question again about, oh, right, yeah, if you stop taking the pill. So I haven't delved into that. That's not in my wheelhouse. Um, but what I do know is that sometimes women go on the pill because they're having menstrual irregularities and so it just kind of evens things out, as you know. And so then they'll be on it for a number of years and then they come off of it. And it turns out that they have fertility problems that were never diagnosed because they were suppressing their normal cycle for all those years. Um, and that is, you know, I think is, is a big issue. But uh, in terms of the pill, the after effects causing uh, fertility problems, I just haven't seen the data on that. So I can't answer it. Uh, related to that, um, Bill, we have a question saying, um, uh, when doctors use uh, hormonal contraception to treat um, female problems like endometriosis, um, isn't there something else that they could do to treat their patient instead of using um, hormonal steroids? Yeah, Patrick Young, uh, who's uh, a Creighton model NFP uh, only uh, OBGYN, gave a great lecture on that at the CMA a few years ago because he's an expert and laparoscopic, you know, surgery for endometriosis. And, you know, with the techniques that they have now, you can treat it, you can get rid of it. You know, why would you want to just kind of suppress it and keep it down when you can completely eradicate it? And, you know, with, with laparoscopic approaches, the surgical risk is much lower than these things used to be. So uh, clearly there are alternatives to it. Um, and, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm a rheumatologist, I'm not an OBGYN, so I don't know. And I, I also have a lot of experience in clinical pharmacology because I've been doing drug development for 25 years. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the way people use these to treat diseases, I mean, people, you know, there are, according to Catholic moral teaching, there are ethical uses for birth control pills, you know, to treat underlying pathologies. But I can tell you that if you talk to people who are in the know, like Les Wuppersberger, who's an NFP on the OBGYN and, and people like that, they'll tell you that, look, there's many other more effective treatments out there. You know, it's like the people who want to treat um, cancer, chemotherapy induced nausea with smoke and marijuana. You know, it's just an excuse is my thought. So, go ahead. We have another question in the um, chat uh, section. Uh, do you know anything uh, about um, mothers who have conceived when they were on hormonal contraception, uh, if they gave birth to a boy, if there is a relationship between then that boy developing prostate cancer? Yeah, I've heard of that, but I just don't have the information at my fingertips. So I, I can't really, you know, um, confirm or deny that one. Mm -hmm. my, my recollection is that there was a suggestive study about that, but you know, the, these other things I'm showing you are the you know, results of multiple studies. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's, it's when you have an observation like that, even if it's seen in a relatively well done large study, you like to see a confirmatory study. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, um, you know, I, I, I can't really say one way or another on that one. Sure. Um, uh, if anybody doesn't have any other um, detailed questions, I'd like to circle back to the idea of getting this information out. Oh, Jennifer, you have a, a question? Go ahead. Oh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, it's kind of related to that. Um, we've been talking about how come the doctors don't know this. Um, does um, FACTS elective courses that Dr. Duane teaches, do, um, include this information? Yeah. Yes, no? 
Well, um, I'm not sure if her course does. I mean, Marguerite's stuff is great. I know that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I know she's familiar with all this stuff. Right, yeah. she, she is. And um, when last she and I discussed these issues, which was over a year ago, she did not want to get into contraception discussion on facts because she wanted it to be wholly focused on educating physicians about NFP science and methods. Right. Um, right. So yeah. I, I'm not sure, uh, but you know, I, I'm thinking more right now, Bill, you're giving me lots of ideas. Um, so for example, uh, why couldn't within the Catholic dioceses of the country, the various um, Catholic Medical Association chapters, why couldn't we give training to those physicians to offer information nights in a parish. Because if the majority of women ac across the country are using hormonal contraception, they have a right to know what's going on with their bodies. And they're not gonna listen to some lay person, but if you have a, a trained physician who's gonna give this information night in the parish, holy smokes, that could be like wildfire. That could be terrific. Um, another thing I'm thinking of is Catholic hospitals when they have their education departments. If there is a, a way to network through um, at least key hospitals, I, I would think we should be able to start with um, uh, giving um, um, continuing education to the physicians associated, even the nurses and nurse practitioners um, in the associated in those hospitals, uh, uh, something like that, uh, uh, but also offering outreach to the wider community. Um, uh, you know, it, it almost seems like, um, yes, uh, somebody said in the chat box, maybe we've got to have social media graphics as well. The only problem I would caution about social media graphics what I've been learning about that as I've been developing social media graphics for the Natural Family Planning Awareness Week is that if you're gonna put something that is loaded, like, like the pill can cause cancer, you have to have the references or else people are not gonna use it. Um, whoever puts it up is gonna get shut down by Facebook or YouTube or whatever. Um, so it's, it's a very tricky situation, but what you could put in, in a social media graphic would be something like, want to understand what's happening to your body when you're on the pill, go to this website. Yeah. I, I think that's probably the, um, the easier thing to do with social yeah. media. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the one thing that the CMA is good at is supplying a lot of that detailed information to back up those claims. So you can go out there and say um, the pill causes, you know, the, or you know, uh, pill increases the risk of breast cancer would be a better way of, of sure. putting, you know. And then here's the papers, you know, like here's ten references about it, you know, and on both sides, and you know. But they're all on one side because that's what the data is. The data is what it is, you know. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's um, our kind of role. I think the CMA's role is more of an advisory role in this. I would love for us to be able to have a big social media presence that gets stuff to go viral. We did make one um, graphic, if you will, that I think is very powerful. It's about abortion. It's uh, narrated by a lady by the name of Jules Green, who's an abortion survivor in the Philadelphia area and has had a marked conversion. And she, you know, mentions that uh, she was, you know, try, tried to commit suicide at one point after her abortion, but that, uh, you know, and all the, all the things that it's, that it's associated with. And then of course it ends with, uh, uh, you know, if you know somebody, who's having these problems, go to Rachel's Vineyard, go to, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, Rachel's, uh, Project Rachel. So, you know, there's always gotta be a positive message, I think, attached with it, a place to go. And for the contraceptive stuff, it should be, that's why I think there's, there's gotta be somebody that, you know, 
everything that's out there in the public in a big way is because of something that makes money. Right. You know, that's the society we live in. Uh, if, if we could find a George Soros to, you know, support airing these ads all over the country, then we could w raise awareness that way. We just don't have them. I know, I know. We have them on the other side trying to shut us down. So. Yeah, exactly. And I, 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 for years, I had wanted us to go after the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, I was too late because Planned Parenthood got a hold of them early on. And um, it's, oh, no. yeah, they're, yeah, yeah, it's just a problem. But you're right, Bill, we do need the resources. But you know, if we don't have the money, we can probably find the money when groups of us get together to conspire and and um, and plan a better communication campaign on this. So um, I can tell you that I'd be very happy um, through my office to work with uh, the Catholic Medical Association, especially um, these I the idea of the social media graphics that bounce people back to the um, um, sure. CMA's website. And then um, CMA, maybe we could have, we could share the information from the Bishop's Conference of the different NFP providers that you can have um, that kind of contact information. And maybe the Creighton model people, we could uh, share the information of the NAPRA technology doctors, um, mm -hmm. have it like one-stop shopping on your website. Yeah, and I, I think I would get natural womanhood involved because yeah, you know I, I've recently become uh, an advisor for them and they're getting all of their, they have like over 200, you know, pages of uh, information for women's health on, on their site. Mm -hmm. And now they're getting them, you know, I, I can't remember what the term is, kind of validated by medical um, experts. I guess I'm an expert on right. it. But, uh, you know, for, for, for different topics. And so, you know, that way they can serve as a, at least an intermediate resource. But if you want something with 100 references, then you have to go to the papers that we published. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, have we talked to Relevant Radio about what? Yeah, we've run, it, we've run ads on Relevant Radio. Uh -huh. Yeah, although we did them predominantly for the Gianna Center uh -huh. uh, in Philadelphia. And that's one, of the, that's one of my goals is to, and right now I think I'm gonna end up working with my Catholic doctor, uh, Kathleen Bretchelman, because they probably have a self-sustaining, uh, uh, you know, way of doing this at this point because they finally are registered with all the major insurers, so that they can, you know, as they get more patients coming in, they can then, you know, run more ads, uh, and their network is expanding. Kathleen said that it's like two or three additional providers are being added almost every week. Wow. That's so. Excellent. You know, they're a great group to interface with who have, you know, boots on the ground right. uh, in terms of the medical care, just like you folks do. Right, right. So. Um, did, did anybody ever try to contact you, Bill, about the Fox News um, contact? No, I tried a couple of times. I have to admit, I wasn't super persistent. I didn't nag them every day. I sent an email. I sent a follow-up email, yeah. but they didn't, they didn't come back. Well, I do have to say in the kingdom of God ideas that tend to travel through my head, um, it would be great to get you and some of your docs, some of the doctors on on a Fox News um, show or even a CBS morning show uh, where, where they're talking about um, an effort that um, is not well known but so much needed uh, because women are just not being told about all of these ha harmful side effects. Yeah, I mean, I, I would try to, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm being honest here. Um, what, what, what's the old saying? I have a face for radio, <laughs> um, but I also have a voice from Long Island. And so it's like, you know, I'm like double cursed. So I've never done a single radio ad because there are better people. You know, we should get something like Kathy Raviel to go oh. on. Um, oh and talk about some of these things because, you know, she's very, she's just wonderful. She, yeah. and she, she's got it all. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's an OBGYN on, on top of it, so. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. true. Uh, yeah, it seems to me that there's gotta be um, a, a stronger effort, uh, maybe a joint effort. Um, we could get some NFP providers together 
right. to support the CMA and uh, with the Bishops Conference and see what we could do about getting this information out there because honestly, um, it's so damning and um, and women just don't know about it. Yeah, well, so, we're, we're, we're willing to help in any way that we can. I'm looking at some of the comments. Unfortunately, we don't have anything in Spanish. Uh, apologize for that. Um, uh, if anybody wants to put some of them in Spanish, I think we can help support that. Uh, uh, well, you know, Bill, once you get the pamphlets developed, again, that's where we could- well, no, We're talking about the radio ads. Oh, the radio ads, okay. Like if somebody knows a good radio voice in Spanish who can do this and, you know, knows where they would go, then, you know, there's, there's ways to arrange for that to happen. Um, counseling service for your marriage org. Uh, I'm not sure who, who that would be. Uh, oh, your for your marriage dot org. Oh, I never heard of that. For your marriage dot org is a, a bishops conference pastoral um, uh, program. Um, uh, yeah, they have a section in it um, about natural family planning. Um, I can talk to the staff person who's in charge of it to see um, if there's a place where we could um, raise this issue. And then again, link to the Catholic Medical Association. For Your Marriage is more like a magazine and a magazine for married couples. So um, it doesn't get into heavy duty research, um, but you know, there certainly should be a way that we can connect to it. Right. So I see from Ar Ar Armida that she wants to uh, work on getting these done in Spanish. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. T Teresa has my email. Sure. Thank right. you. Yeah, and our meet is from the Diocese of Phoenix. So Phoenix, Arizona, got a lot of a lot of strong stuff going on there. That'd be great. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Well, Thank we're you. we're unfortunately, see what I mean? We are at the end of our hour. I can't understand how quickly <laughs> this has gone by. Um, but Dr. Bill, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us and all of this amazing research that is so important for, um, for women, for women in the church, women in general. Um, this, is, this is a wonderful effort. Um, I'm sure all of us will pray for um, uh, God's blessings that um, you'll get the message out and fight, keep fighting the good fight. Uh, so if we could end um, saying a glory be together, I'd love that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you again, and thanks everyone for joining us. Sure, it's an honor. And thank you everybody for what you're doing. You're awesome. <laughs> God bless. Thank you. Thank you.